Hello traders, it's Wednesday, March the 22nd. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give you a market wrap-up, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the 24 to 48 hours ahead. Well, the number one question on most traders' mind is whether this crack in the S&P 500 as a champion of risk trends is evidence of a uh, systemic move in sentiment a full-scale reversal in risk trends that is going to unleash the opportunities that we have long awaited and a buildup of uh, the massive gap between pricing on risk-oriented assets and the value. Too early to say. Way too early to say. Uh, I go into detail about uh, why we need to, to be restrained and be extra vigilant on our calls for systemic moves of particularly this magnitude eight-year buildup, uh, trying to call it on a single day move, um, because this is the time in which we are most uh, exposed to the influence of emotion, anxiety, and uh, just a, a long drought of opportunity is going to encourage us to see uh, earlier initial moves like this as just an opportunity that if we wait too long uh, we're going to miss out on. But if it is indeed a full-scale risk aversion uh, move, the buildup that we've seen, and that's not just in uh, the exposure for risk-oriented divergence like here, but in terms of the use of leverage, both notional leverage and thematic leverage, uh, the buildup is going to lead to some very significant unwinding in the market. We don't have to call on a single day. All right. It is better to wait for full conviction to get involved in a uh, big picture, full scale uh, in a trade setup like that than uh, to just keep jumping in on false starts, which there are just so many false starts littered throughout the past years, and many traders have been pulled in. I've been pulled in a couple times uh, by them, so I'm not going to give over my conviction to appetite, uh, pure appetite uh, and anxiety. I'll, I'll reserve my uh, call on this. I go into detail about uh, really taking this with a quantitative approach and letting emotions take a back seat in today's strategy video. You can check it out. Um, but in general, this is a very tentative move. Nevertheless, it's impressive. Uh, this was the biggest drop that we had seen uh, since way back here, I believe in uh, September was the comparable move. Oh no, sorry, October, October 11th. Uh, very impressive decline and clearly the biggest drop from the U.S. equity index that we had seen since before the U.S. election. Now, was this a uniform risk-based move? Uh, were we seeing that at least tentative drive for other risk-oriented assets? Yes. Emerging market ETF, uh, high-yield uh, ETF, even the commodity index was starting to slip back, although its uh, pullback was far more restrained than some of its other risk-oriented counterparts. And of course, in the FX market, the carry trade uh, was pulling back, whether that be the Aussie USD, or the dollar index itself. This is uh, still confounding, I think, more people than uh, we should uh, allow for. All right, so we'll, we'll take some time on this once again, why the dollar can continue to drop in the face of risk aversion. But before we get there, um, the tentative move that we have in risk aversion, when looking for opportunity, it's very important that we treat it as tentative. Uh, I, I would not call this as a you know, the start of a 10% a drop uh, in the S&P 500, much less a 20%, which would be the technical call of a bear trend. Uh, for technical perspective, this was the first time in 110 trading days, All right, so excluding weekend, excluding holidays, in which we've had a 1% or great, a greater daily drop. That is a long period of quiet, but that is also a very uh, low-hanging change. 
to get to the, the, the serious stages of a 10% correction. It's been a long time, 256 trading days. Uh, it's been uh, over 2,000 trading days since 20% uh, or bear market. So it's very, very early to call this as something more than just a tentative break of a rising trend post-U.S. election with uh, finally some revival of volume and volatility. Beyond that, I think it's a little bit too aggressive to call anything more substantive. Uh, we can be prepared. We should be prepared. Should we indeed see a continuation of momentum in a broadening of the risk-based move, All right, to see it transition to other asset classes, where instead of uh, the debate of uh, how much uh, of this particular asset class is, a class is a central bank buying, uh, or how are supply and demand factoring in, or uh, what's the outlook for GDP, all those things go to the side, and we just concentrate on what's my risk exposure, do I need to get out now to protect my capital, is that the only concern that I have as an investor? All right, when we get to that blinders perspective, then we just pay attention to risk trends. Nothing else comes into the equation uh, until that panic wears off. But in this early phase, in the very early phase, I'm still operating with the short-term view, a short-term perspective. Now, in terms of risk aversion, if risk aversion does continue, uh, but let's say it does so at a measured pace, the likes of the Aussie USD are much more attractive in my view. Why? Because between these two currencies, uh, the Aussie dollar is the higher risk orientation. It is a carry trade currency and is treated as, as such. Um, we know that the Aussie dollar has outperformed the U.S. dollar, even though the dollar has gained significantly in uh, recent months because of its interest rate outlook. The Aussie dollar still outperforms because of its carry appeal. It is a carry currency uh, considered amongst the majors, particularly because of that. So I don't need a full-scale risk aversion to pull Aussie USD back. All I need is just a, a passive risk aversion, which is going to prevent uh, that break above 7750, which is uh, really going to be tough to achieve and would require a very significant opportunity on the Aussie dollar's part or a really intense risk on, which would revive the appetite for Aussie uh, debt or government bonds or other carry assets within Australia uh, to draw capital in just for purely the yield's sake. So pullback here is much easier to achieve. Uh, that is in contrast to the dollar yen. Uh, the dollar yen definitely is a risk-oriented currency pair. In fact, I think it's, it's a leveraged risk. This is perhaps the most intense exposure to risk-based theme that you're going to get uh, in at least the medium term. Why? There are two fundamental themes that are catered to here. All yen crosses are risk-oriented, as we've said uh, on an almost daily basis now. Uh, so when risk aversion actually kicks in, all the yen crosses are dropping. doesn't matter what the Bank of Japan thinks it's going to do. Central bank effectiveness, as we uh, have talked about recently, is throttling back and throttling back quickly. That means that the Bank of Japan can do whatever it wants. It's not going to offset the motivated flows of risk aversion. That's just too much capital for them to offset. So that pulls back yen crosses. But we also have here the dollars aspect, which the dollar has been outperforming because of its appetite for yield. Now, the outlook for rate expectations have not done the dollar much in the way of favors for further lift in recent weeks and months. Uh, that's why that disappointing response to the Fed rate hike last Wednesday uh, was touched off. It, it was a hike, which is very unusual compared to its counterparts, but it wasn't as aggressive as what the markets had anticipated. Now, if we do get into risk aversion, the likelihood that the Fed is going to be able to uh, actually pursue those two additional rate hikes in 2017 is going to drop substantially, uh, much less the forecasts for four or five rate hikes through 2017, which uh, speculators were acting to price in, but becomes increasingly unlikely in the face of risk aversion. As that comes to pass, we're going to have a pullback from the dollar, which is why we do have a correlation, a positive correlation, which we fundamentally in an academic sense think is an unusual situation, but we have a positive correlation between the S&P 500, the equity index, and the U.S. dollar, which we traditionally consider to be a safe haven. All right, That's because we've been treating the dollar more and more as a carry opportunity. 
or at least the advantage of building up momentum in a carry uh, early carry phase. So going back to the dollar yen, there's a lot of pressure here. We can break this collective support at about 111.30 uh, to 111.50. Uh, this is recent support going all the way back uh, essentially through 2017 and a little bit into December. Uh, but to break a significant technical boundary and then find follow through. All right. That is not a, a path of least resistance. It is a little bit more complicated. It is uh, certainly uh, demanding of more conviction. So it goes essentially this way. To move within a range requires the least amount of conviction. To make a break and actually find significant follow-through takes greater conviction. To fuel a prevailing trend takes the greatest amount of conviction. Where are we at? Well, if we're using the S&P 500 as our benchmark, it, there, there's not a lot of conviction that's going to be had here. There's not enough time, there's not enough momentum, there's not enough evidence that people are uh, throwing everything off the boat so they don't sink. So I will keep a close eye on this, and it does present considerable opportunity, but it does demand greater conviction. Now, other yen crosses are in a similar position. Aussie yen has actually tentatively broken its range, or uh, the wedge formation here. Now, is this a move back into a range, or is this the same kind of situation as the dollar yen, where it's a break with follow through? Uh, th that's more a abstract decision. All right, that's where we have to gauge our risk tolerance, our convictions in this early move. Uh, but this is a more transitional between the Aussie USD and the dollar yen. Uh, the Kiwi yen has already made its break, so perhaps it's cleared uh, to keep just extending the move. Pound yen, which we talked about yesterday, uh, being tight in that wedge, shouldn't that break? That has a need for a break. It's out of room, essentially, going down to a four-hour chart. The range that we are left with is a little over 125 pips. That's extremely tight. And yet it hasn't actually con, uh, thrown in with that degree of conviction. Euro yen is restrained as well. CAD yen being another carry currency uh, is just extending its move. All right, so we have to evaluate the opportunities. Now, the same is true with the dollar. Uh, the dollar is pulling back to its head and shoulders neckline. It has a reason to drop on risk aversion because it can stymie rate forecasts, which are very still pumped up, uh, and it can pull back on the dollar's already existing risk on exposure. Uh, but it depends on how much conviction is going to come through because we're going to have to crash through a collective of very important support, not just the neckline and the head and shoulders pattern, 38.2 fib here, rising trend line, and this is not just for the index, this is for many of the crosses. Obviously, the most Remarkable of these is the inverse head and shoulders pattern, just a mirror of the dollar index. Uh, the ad inverse head and shoulders pattern here on the euro USD. Neckline at about 108 to all the way up to 108.25. If there's a lot of conviction in dollar selling, yes, the euro USD can rise. Yes, the euro would look like a safe haven. This is not unusual. It's happened actually not too long ago. Back here during the August 2015 uh, drop from the uh, risk view. So if you recall from the S&P 500, that was a massive drop. During that period, the euro USD actually rallied. The euro took the position of being a safe haven. It's not a safe haven. It's just people taking off uh, their carry expectations, people investing in dollar or US-based assets for higher returns, uh, just looking to take advantage of the, the capital that's going to flow in behind them, and using the euro as the short side of that equation, uh, but capital repatriates in a safe haven environment, and that means European investors pulling back from uh, foreign investments. So, yes, this is one that's going to require conviction. It's a very prominent technical setup. Uh, it has the fundamental basis, so don't uh, think that this is just going to revert back to the U.S. dollar being a safe haven. Eventually, the U.S. dollar, if we do see a full-scale risk aversion, uh, the dollar will revert to its safe haven status. But that's an intensity we need to get up to. Uh, the U.S. dollar ha it has a lot of premium to shed on a risk front. To get back to the absolute liquidity haven that we see in the U.S. dollar and U.S. treasuries and U.S. money markets, we need to work off a lot of that exposure. All right. Also, uh, 
we looked at the dollar yen, we looked at the euro USD. Uh, we can also look at, well, the Aussie USD, which is a path of least resistance, as we talked about before. Kiwi, dollar, dollar, CAD are similar in nature, but their technicals aren't immediately opportunistic. Uh, if you want to get further away from the risk on, risk off theme, keep uh, an eye on pound dollar. Uh, this is further from that influence, and it is definitely one to keep on uh, the dock. Uh, the docket if you are looking for something to avoid the back and forth, especially if risk trends don't take, which is a very high probability given uh, the history we've had with uh, the risk on theme and the risk off theme over the past years. As for event risk, all right, the past 24 hours had a number of noteworthy events. Uh, the Aussie docket uh, did generate a little bit of traction for the Australian dollar, but not a lot of follow through. Uh, we had a improved trade relationship between Europe and Japan. That was between Prime Minister Abe and the EU's Junker and Tusk. Their conversation proved to be fruitful. The British pound with that cable rally that we had saw uh, seen right here, uh, modest in the context of the Brexit, but still impressive itself, uh, was motivated by the UK CPI figures. Uh, the CPI figures were faster, and definitely the conversation is coming back to uh, what the situation will be with the Bank of England pursuing rate hikes because of inflation pressures, or whether they're going to be uh, uh, sitting and turtling uh, with the uncertainties of Brexit still ahead. Consider that with something like this break on pound kiwi, uh, although there's another complication here, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, pound Aussie, which had a nice technical break, even the pound CAD uh, has a very noteworthy break here. Uh, but is there enough for conviction? Eh, we'll have to see if that's the case. I don't think the Bank of England speculation is going to be uh, catching a lot of traction here, especially with the Brexit uncertainty still ahead. On the U.S. docket, a lot of Fed speak. Once again, Kashkari was in the news. He was doing a Q&A impromptu on Twitter, and he was speaking once again on the needs for plans uh, when it comes to balance sheet adjustment. And he also threw out an expectation that the neutral rate would now be 75 base points of additional hikes. That is much lower than I think many of his counterparts are looking for. So he's a dove. At the same time, he is spelling out what the next phase is on monetary policy debate. George and Mester, uh, no, de uh, no surprise here. They are the uh, hawks on accommodative monetary policy leading to financial imbalance, which is a uh, now well-known statement and I think a common conviction amongst even bulls in the market. In the next 24 hours, the docket is going to thin out. We're going to have more Fed speak, probably uh, almost all of it uh, unscheduled. We have a couple of, uh, of uh, trade, euros and trade, and U.S. existing home sales, so noteworthy event risks, but nothing that really gets high profile. Uh, the only really high profile event is the RBNZ rate decision early Wellington session. Uh, watch this closely. Um, it'll have a significant impact on the Kiwi dollar, but if we're talking about risk on, risk off, Kiwi dollar, Kiwi yen, all right, these are being currency pairs that are going to be motivated by much bigger trends. My uh, interests are going to be in something like the Aussie Kiwi, if we're talking about the RBNZ rate decision trying to re uh, render an influence on the exchange rate. Aussie Kiwi is particularly attractive to me if the RBNZ starts to ponder rate hikes in the foreseeable future, not just next meeting or two meetings ahead, but in the next 12 months. Even if it's 12 months out, it's very different than many of its counterparts, and it's going to start a phase which uh, brings it back to its, quote-unquote, uh, yield glory. Uh, we consider the Kiwi one of the currency major currencies specifically because of its, its yield. Uh, putting that back on pace is going to probably lift the Kiwi, especially against something like the Aussie dollar, which hasn't seen the same kind of conviction with the RBA. So Aussie Kiwi and Kiwi CAD are good in these terms. If the RBNZ sticks with a very dovish view, then perhaps the KiwiCAD uh, might have enough to actually make a break on this head and shoulders pattern. But isolate the event risk for what it's capable of, of uh, achieving. All right, when you have counter themes like risk trends, that is a very big fundamental offset that you're going to try to be working against. And it's probably even after a surprise event, let's say the RBNZ says it's going to hike it at one of the subsequent meetings. Uh, that's a strong Kiwi response, but is it going to be able to run in the face of a rising risk aversion view for, let's say, the Kiwi dollar, Kiwi yen?
Probably not. People are not going to want a slightly higher yield on a, a record low return carry trade. So putting it always, always, always into context. Now, the fact that we don't have a lot of other event risk on the docket uh, shouldn't put you at ease. That puts me at greater disease because if we continue to see risk aversion kick in, then it's doing so without a particular catalyst. There's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of blame assigned to various considerations. We've talked about a number of fundamental issues underlying these circumstances uh, over the months and years. Uh, so it's a structural issue. It's not just one piece of event risk or development, uh, but if risk aversion does take, um, put it into context. Yeah, look at it for what it is big picture. The uh, long-lasting view of complacency that has motivated investors to take greater and greater risk for smaller and smaller return out of necessity. All right? Working that off can impose a very substantial change in market value. All right, with vigilance on mind, we will wrap it up. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.